very much. Um, I think I might retitle this talk, Desperate Measures for Desperate Times. <laughs> or maybe even another title might be Serendipity. So we'll just to keep those two things in mind as I, as I, as I go through this. Um, I was a graduate student. You could back calculate when this happened. But when I was a graduate student, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere were running around 348 parts per million. So you can go back on the Keeling curve and figure out when I was in when grad school. 1985, about 1985. And now, of course, we're well north of 410 parts per million. And this is driving not just global change, but I would argue we're headed into a, we're headed into a climate crisis that we're rapidly approaching. And so uh, here are our emissions. Our emissions <coughs> over the last several decades continually going up. One of the things folks don't think about very much is um, if, we are to, if we are to meet the target of two degrees C warming or less by the end of the century, we're not going to do that just by cutting emissions. CO2 has a rather long atmospheric lifetime. And one of the little secrets that we don't talk about very much is we're going to have to very rapidly develop negative carbon technologies or technologies for actively removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So I guess a third title would be geoengineering strategies that are palatable. Um, so I'm going to talk about some geoengineering strategies today because I think, I think we're headed to the point where we're getting quite desperate to deal with this challenge. And so, so here's what we would see for uh, global CO2 emissions. Uh, if, if we were to meet this two degree, uh, two degree uh, max by the end of the century, this is kind of what we'd have to do to emissions from industry and land use change. But as you can see, that wouldn't be enough. We've got to go to negative emissions actually to get ourselves where net emissions are negative and we can actually meet these climate targets. So, uh, so this is kind of scary. How do you get CO2, a highly diffuse, low concentration gas with big impact on the climate system, out of the atmosphere and, and back in the ground? Well, here are a number of different approaches that the IPCC has been studying and looking at and folks from around the world have been, been uh, trying to explore for sequestering atmospheric carbon dioxide. Um, I'll, I'll go through a few of them, but, but as I'm going through them, think about are, are they permanent? Is CO2 permanently removed or at least on a thousand year time step and permanent in terms of human lifetimes? Um, what are the costs? Are commercial, uh, are large scale commercial applications, have they been tested? Um, and, and, and the answer with many of these is gonna be uh, no to, to one or more of those issues. But, but one, that, one that's kind of a favorite right now is BEX. This is bioenergy and carbon capture that's growing crops that are carbon neutral, using those crops to generate electricity and capturing the flue gas um, as the CO2 is coming out the, the, the stack and then injecting that, injecting that below ground into permanent storage reservoirs. So that's one approach. Of course, forestation is, a, is, a, is an important component of this. Um, you have questions about the permanent, how permanent that, uh, that carbon sink is given that the tropics are now burning. Um, this is kind of a cute one. Direct air capture. Imagine, imagine huge fans set up around the, around the world with CO2 scrubbers behind them. Think of the economics of that one. Um, biochar, uh, essentially a reduction process of carbon and then using it as a soil amendment has been looked at very carefully. Of course, this made a big splash, no pun intended, a little while ago, ocean fertilization. And what I'm going to talk about today is enhanced weathering. Before you laugh me out of the room, we're going to have to do some or all of these things if we're going to meet our climate targets. So, it's, so in, in addition to very, very rapid reductions in emissions. Well, let's take a little closer look at, at, at enhanced weathering. I mean, this is a process that's been going on for as long as there have been rocks and CO2 in the atmosphere. But basically what happens is CO2 combines with water to make carbonic acid. Carbonic acid interacts with igneous rocks, basalts, silicaceous rocks to degrade that. This is the natural weathering process. It produces bicarbonate, a little bit of calcium carbonates. These substances move through groundwater uh, into our ocean, into our streams and rivers, and out into the oceans. So this is basically an argument, not calcareous rocks, because calcareous rocks, when you weather those, they put CO2 back in the atmosphere, but igneous rocks, that process can produce bicarbonate, which then is essentially using the ocean as a sink for atmospheric carbon dioxide. Now this process, as I mentioned, is, uh, is, is, has been going on on a geologic time step. There are probably some ancillary benefits to this weathering process. It produces calcium, silicate, uh, silica, uh, potassium, other plant micronutrients. So there, there, 
their ancillary benefits uh, to crops, uh, to plants in general, in addition to uh, sequestering atmospheric carbon dioxide. So the question is, can we use this process to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? Can we accelerate what's already happening? So before going to that, let's think about scale. Um, so here are our global emissions. And so we're, we're again now well north of 11 gigatons of carbon per year being emitted into the atmosphere. Here are the various sources, coal, oil, gas, cement production are the, are the biggies. Uh, land use change, of course, expansion of agriculture, deforestation associated with that is also a major component to our carbon emissions globally. And if we're to map on this, the natural weathering carbon sink, it's about half a gigaton per year. So it's not inconsequential, but it's pretty small. And so the question is, can we increase that through management techniques by about tenfold? Can we do it affordably and sustainably? I mean, if we got into this range, you know, five, six gigatons per year from enhanced weathering, it could certainly be a piece of our carbon reduction portfolio. So how would you accelerate the weathering process? Well, you could put more carbonic acid in the atmosphere. We probably don't want to go that route. But if you take rock and grind it up, increase its surface area, and put it in warm, wet places, that would enhance the weathering process and enhance this, this, this production. And so that's basically what I'm talking about, is putting ground rock on soils. Well, Dave Beerling, who is the uh, head of the Leverhulme Center for Climate Change up at Sheffield, who supported this research, did a proof of concept a little while ago. I think it was published in Science Magazine. And asked, what if you were to do this in a warm, wet place globally? You know, just as, a, just as a kind of proof of concept. Now, I don't think it's actually feasible what he did. He wasn't claiming it was feasible. But what if you were to put ground basalt on 30% of the tropical land area? I'm talking forests, fertilizing forests with ground basalt. And they ran, they ran a, a global circulation model to see what consequences that would have if they actually did that. And here are the results, some of the results from that paper. Oops, it was in Nature Climate Change. Um, and let's just look at this one. These are various RCP scenarios, 4.5, 4.5 with either one kilogram per <coughs> meter squared per year, one ton per hectare of, of ground rock put on the surface of the soil, or five tons per hectare. And here's the regular emissions scenarios, okay, under the various RCP scenarios. And these black lines and black dotted lines, this, this is a type of rock and the different depth of application. And what you can see here, and the numbers aren't so important, but what you can see is, at least theoretically, this approach, if applied on massive scale, could accelerate the reductions of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so the question becomes, that's a modeling exercise, and, and we all love modeling exercises, but is there any basis in reality here? And so the question becomes, can we do it? Can we test it under field circumstances? And so rather than fertilizing tropical rainforests, we thought, well, let's think about using this as an application to agricultural landscapes, where we're already using, using a lot of different management techniques and we have the tools to actually apply it. I don't actually know how you would propose to apply this to 30% of the tropical forests around the, around the world. But in, a, in an agricultural context, we've got the machines to do that. And so we set up an experiment at the University of Illinois in a corn-soybean system rotation uh, and, a, and a parallel experiment in a miscanthus plot. So miscanthus is, a, is, a, um, is an Asian hybrid uh, that we grow, Myscanthus giganteus, for biofuel production. It's an enormous, enormous biomass producer. And we asked the question, if we do applications of, of, of basalt in this particular experiment, we were applying at about five tons per hectare, you know, can we see any of these reductions in, in carbon in the atmosphere? And we measure that with the eddy covariance technique, which is a way of measuring land atmosphere exchange of carbon dioxide. We also have experimental plots where, where underneath the plots, we have um, essentially pipes that capture all the water leaving the system. So can we detect bicarbonate leaving, leaving the system? And can we actually measure, well, we can, what are the results of measuring the rates of, of enhanced weathering by looking at various strontium, strontium isotopes? And so over a couple of years, we put ground rock on fields. And this is the chemistry of the rocks we put on the field. And we use two different rock sources, Cascade and Blue Ridge, both mined in the eastern part of the United States. And, and this stuff, this stuff is a, it's a waste product, essentially, because we're talking about very fine rock material. The coarse material is used, if you have asphalt shingles on your house for roofing, they're kind of bumpy, and they're very heavy. Well, that bumpy stuff is basalt. 
and the fines are a waste product. So we've got a whole industry that's really hoping this technique works because they've got a new, pro a new, uh, a new market for their, for their waste, waste streams. Um, but you can see there's, there's iron, magnesium, silica, uh, some phosphorus in these rocks, and, and depending on the source, um, it, they can vary quite substantially. So, um, so we bought a lot of rock material and brought it to the farm. This is a small pile. This is a pile after we've spread most of it on the farm. And we had replicated experimental plots. I won't go into all the, all the details of, of the experimental design, but properly replicated experimental plots at scale, at farm scale, so that we could actually do proper harvesting of the crop and use this eddy covariance technique. Now here's the serendipity part. Um, I've got no carbon data to show you. This whole story is about carbon. I've got no carbon data to show you. We haven't worked up those data yet. We're starting to get hints of an effect on the carbon cycle. But what I want to show you is some, some really intriguing data on the nitrogen cycle. This is kind of a co-benefit of this approach. So, um, so we put it on the fields. And uh, the way you put it on the fields, in, uh, this, for any of you who have agricultural backgrounds, this isn't crazy. We put rock on fields all the time. We lime fields. And so this is the machine that limes fields at scale. And so instead of lime, we're putting in ground, ground basalt in the system. And you'll notice this basalt's a little bit dark. Um, and the basalts vary quite a bit in their color. And one of the things we noticed early on was kind of interesting and sort of a fun thing. You can see the basalt plot here. This is when we were doing small plots before we started our experiments at scale. And this is an infrared image of those plots. It's dark, so it was no surprising that it was actually warming the soil. That could have a whole host of different biogeochemical effects. But I will say that it's very short-lived. The minute that canopy closes you know, in you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine days, um, that, that, that warming effect goes away. It can be, it can be one, two, three degrees, but it, it goes away. It goes away pretty quickly. But what we noticed early on, and so this is, these are data over a couple of years now, three years in the case of our control plots with, uh, with maize. This is maize with basalt and maize control plots. And these are our miscanthus plots over a couple of year period. Um, with the maize plots, we till it in. Yeah, with the maize plots, we till it in. And with the miscanthus plots, we put it on the surface. We're seeing an increase in soil pH. And that increase in soil pH is translating directly to a reduction in nitrous oxide from these fields. And so you see these bumps. This is typical nitrous oxide traces in control and basalt treatment plots. This is associated, these bumps are associated with fertilization or rain events. This is the kind of typical trace you see for nitrous oxide. And these are the cumulative nitrous oxide emissions for the control plots and the basalt treated plots. Every year, we resolve a statistical reduction in N2O emissions from corn. We didn't resolve any change in this year. The one year we did get a statistical reduction, a statistical change in, in miscanthus, it was also a reduction. We're starting to see a little hint of increased yields in our crops with the basalt addition. We were interested in how, how is this basalt working? Is it a fertilization effect from phosphorus that it's liberating, or is it a pH effect? We haven't done the bench science to do that, but we used a biogeochemical model, Descent, and that biogeochemical model is telling us that most of the effect that we're seeing with basalt addition is coming from a pH effect, not a phosphorus effect. So it seems like that pH effect is playing out. Then we used a global circulation model, and we said, OK, what would happen if we did this over the entire Midwestern growing region of the United States? And here are the nitrous oxide emissions that you would see over the entire Corn Belt of the United States if you were to add basalt that gave you a 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5 delta in pH. So what we're seeing is an ancillary benefit of basalt application. So what we set out to study was what would basalt do to CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. We don't know yet. But what we are finding is that in agricultural context, so radiative forcing from N2O is very, very important, enormously strong greenhouse gas. Almost all N2O emissions are coming from agricultural practices. And we're seeing that basalt additions is giving us a reduction in that N2O. Of course, the really big question is, what are the life cycle implications of basalt? So you got to grind up rock, you got to move it around, and you got to put it on fields. And we haven't done a life cycle analysis yet. I'll be in Sheffield next week, working in two weeks, working on exactly that question. I'm guardedly optimistic it will work out because we get profitability and good life cycle emissions from limestone application to fields. But you can imagine transportation costs, the emissions associated with transportation costs, all could be quite high. 
So I'm not giving up on it yet. I'm not proposing it yet. I am saying desperate measures, desperate times require desperate measures, and we've got to start looking very carefully at uh, net negative emission scenarios. So thank you very much.